Happy Sabbath. Happy day. God is good. And all the time. Hallelujah. 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 Amen and amen. I was told hallelujah is the highest form of praise that gets the devil and his angels out of the place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. This is homecoming. When I came, I felt nimefika kirenyaga kwa mama yangu. I am so excited. I am feeling at home. And surely I have missed the worship. I think there is no worship like New Life's worship. I've been to many churches, but for sure, the Lord is here with us. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And I do know the Lord is here today because we have praised him. We have welcomed him to this place. And I thank God. Um, the children just summarized my sermon. So I, I think uh, the sermon was very good. And uh, we could go home. But since I was invited, I will preach. And thank you, Gladys, for inviting me. I have a passion for women. And so when I'm called by women, it's always a pleasure. And as I prepare, I preach to myself before I preach to anyone. So for me, I take advantage when I'm invited because I grow before I speak to the people. And uh, uh, maybe I need to... We've always been told when you go before the congregation, you always give a testimony. And uh, I know there are very many young people here who do not know me. I left this place maybe about eight or nine years ago. And you know, I have a granddaughter who I used to come with, who had a lot of challenges. And... Uh, the people of this church used to pray. Every time we went for the surgery, the people in this church, led by Edwina Ombado, used to pray for my grandchild. She still has issues, but we have seen God. She's turning 12 on 29th. And for me, that is God. Okoth always reminds me the faithful Easter when she was born. Because she was just born on 29th. Easter was, she was born on a Monday. Easter was Friday. And that was the darkest Easter. I think it was as dark as when Christ was, born, was, was crucified. But for 12 years, we have seen the hand of God. I couldn't come with her though. She's fine. She can do a lot of things. She still goes to school and she's brilliant. Um, but I couldn't come with her today. But I just want to tell you, she is fine. She is doing well. She, had ha she has had more than 25 surgeries, but she always comes through without any effects at all. She still has to go through many more, but we have seen the power of prayer. And when I come here on the International Day of Women's Prayer, I would do a disservice to God if I do not say what God has done in my life and in my granddaughter's life. One day I will bring her here. I had, she did a clip. I had hoped I could give it as a testimony, but another time. So I just want to share that testimony because the old people who know me they all knew about Alma. She is Alma. And the name Alma means wholeness. And we pray and I continue praying that she will be whole. When I call her Alma, I am saying wholeness. You're whole in Jesus' name. That's my prayer that I always pray. And thank you for praying for us. Continue praying for her. She still has many, many surgeries to go through. But even as we go through the surgeries, we know God does not create defects. That's the work of the evil one. 
and the Christ came to destroy the works of the devil and I still believe and hold on to that promise that God is a healer. The way he healed that time, if he resurrected people, even today, he can still give her those parts of her body that she does not have. That's the promise I hold on to. And that's the prayer I ask for the new life brethren to continue praying for us. Um, now, before we begin, I just want to, I, I love Paul's prayer to Ephesians. And that's, prayer, that, that's the prayer I would want us to pray before we begin. Ephesians 1 verse 17. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that we may understand what we are reading today. It's my prayer for each one of us in Jesus' name. Now, the title of my sermon is Flip the Switch. Flip the switch. That's American, that's not our normal English. Our normal English would be switch on the light. But I am not focusing on the light. I am focusing on the switch. That's why I think the American English will be more applicable today. Flip the switch, turn on the switch. That's my sermon this morning. And uh, before I read the text, I want to talk about power. Because flipping the switch is about putting the light on. The power, the Kenya power, provides power for all of us. But all of us use the power differently. When I go home, my mother has a fridge, but she will not even remember to put the food in the fridge. She will only use the power to put on the lights and maybe her TV. When we come to our homes, we will use the power for many things, maybe for lighting, for the fridge, ironing, and all those things. When we go to hospitals, the power is used for many things, whether it's the theater or wherever it is. When we go to an industry, they use the power. How much power you use does not depend on Kenya power. How much power you use depends on you. It depends on what you need it for, and it also depends on your knowledge of that power. And maybe to use a, a better description, the fonts that we have, you will find that for people my age, the analog, we will only use it for WhatsApp, we use it for M-Pesa, we use it for calling, and maybe to watch some things on YouTube. Other people will have many different apps, but there are those people who use the gadget and they become millionaires. We are using the same phone with the same applications but it applies differently to all of us. Why? It depends on your need and it depends on your knowledge. And when it comes to God, when we are dealing with God, it's the same thing. It depends on our knowledge and on our need. But sometimes it's not so much on our need, it's our knowledge of God. So that you will find I and another person, we are believers, we are saved. Maybe we fast and pray. But then you find that other person is enjoying a full life. Is having so many benefits which I'm not enjoying. Yet, maybe I have even fast and I pray more than they do. But then they have the application they have more apps than I do. So God, it's not about God. God, like that, the owner of that company, the owner of that phone has put all the applications there. But how many applications I apply to my life 
is dependent on me. It's not dependent on God. I hope you're getting it because we are, oh, I'm waiting for God to do this and this. Excuse me, the app is already there. Do you know how to download it? It's up to you, you to know how to download it. And the key verse this morning, it's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. Oh, sorry, chapter, second Peter. Oh, sorry, I had, uh, I thought I had the, the page with me, but it's not. Let me just. And when Peter is writing, he's like writing to those people who have obtained like precious faith. So if you have obtained the faith like Peter had obtained, then he's speaking to you. So it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through this you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. I want to dissect that, that verse because what I've been talking about power is really talking about this verse. Peter talking to those people who have like faith like him, he tells us grace, his grace has provided to us the divine power, divine power, divine power is the grace that God has provided for us. Grace is what God gives to us. God has, through his divine power, has given to us all, how many things? All that we need for life and for godliness. So the divine power, the grace of God has given us all things, not some things, all things that we need for life and godliness. And when we think about life here, I'm thinking of things like forgiveness, things like deliverance, health, wholeness, prosperity, peace, wisdom, joy. God has provided us to all those things. So let nobody say, I, do, I am sick, I cannot get healed. Christ provided health for us. Christ has provided forgiveness for all of us. All things that you can think from the Bible, what the Bible tells us, all those things have been provided for us. And not just about those things. He has also given us for life and godliness. And godliness to me, I, I, I want to imagine, it's the spiritual disciplines that we need for our Christian growth. And when we look at verse 5, verse 5 to 7, I will not go through it. Second Peter 1 verse 5 to 7, it talks about how you grow from diligence, from faith, virtue, knowledge. So his grace has given us all we need for life and godliness. And why all these things are available to us, they are dependent on the knowledge of God. They are dependent on who God is to you. They are dependent on what you believe God is all about. And I know we read the Bible, but unfortunately what I've realized, because I have had to detox a lot of the th teachings that I had from church, 
from the time I was young. I am still detoxing and I still find that I still become a victim to the belief systems that we have, the knowledge that we have of God. Because many of us will say, oh, you go to see a sick person, um, like my, my father, he passed on. When he was sick, you would go to see him in hospital and you'd tell him, let us pray, you're going to be healed. And he would say, according to God's will. And it was a struggle for us to tell him, no, what is God's will about our sickness? What does God tell us about our sickness? If Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and sickness, John 10.10, 10, it's the devil who steals, it's the devil who kills, it's the devil who destroys. Where then, how can we then talk about God's will when we are sick? That if God wills, I will get well. If God doesn't will, I will die. Excuse me. This is the theology that we have to change. Because the knowledge of God, when I think that it's, it, it, sometimes it's God's will that I may not get well. So when I think God teaches me through diseases, then I will not struggle. I will not fight with the illness. Because I may be saying it's God's will. But when I look at the Bible, the Bible does not say that God brings diseases. Christ came to destroy diseases. So how can God bring diseases? How can it be God's will that I should be sick? So the, the kind of the life that we are living depends very much on the knowledge of God. When you have the right knowledge of God, then you will believe right and you will pray right. And I'm here to say, as Adventists, I think it's time we started reading the Bible differently. Because for me, as I've told you, from what I was taught from when I was young throughout church, it is a detox. You know, I'm trying to change it, replace it with the truths of the Bible about God. Because the knowledge of God determines what kind of life you live. And I want you to think about your life and you see how much does your know, what is it that you know about God? Is, who is God to you? What is the picture that you have of God? Many times we look at God and we say, oh, God is angry with me. But if you read Isaiah 53, I don't know what verse it pleased God for Christ to die. Not because he's a sadist, but because that was the only way to save me. And it, because it pleased God, every time I wake up, God is pleased with me. Every time, even when I'm sinning, God is pleased with me. And if God is pleased with me, I do not have fear going to him because there is no guilt. There is no condemnation. I walk with boldness to his throne of grace because I know he is not, he is not happy with what I've done, but he is pleased with me. Not because of my performance, because it, Christ took all God's wrath. God is not angry at you anymore. And I believe when you know that, it changes the way you relate to God and your life will never be deep, the same again. So we have been given all that we need for life and godliness. I have not yet started my sermon. I should have warned you. I, I am a teacher without the discipline of keeping time. I am an advocate and advocates we love listening to our voices. So I will teach and I am also listening to my own voice and enjoying it. So I will take some time. Please allow me. So we have been given all that we need for life and godliness. And what, through the knowledge of God. So what picture do you have of God? And I wish we would all get, take a break. And just forget everything. And learn who God is. His nature. His character. Because when you use the character, the nature of God as your compass, anytime you, you start saying something, you will say, mm -mm, 
that is not the nature of God. So this is not God. We really need to do that. And he has given through the knowledge of God. By which he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these promises, as we interact with the promises that God has given us, we get to engage with them. We claim them and we see them working in our lives. We shall acquire the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in this world. So the knowledge of God, the promises, I have had it said from the pulpit here many, many times, and I will repeat it without fear or favor because I'm using the Bible. We keep on saying, oh, God's promises are yes, no, wait. Where is the Bible basis of that? The only scripture that I know from the Bible it says God does not change. He's not a man that he should lie. He's a covenant God. And when he gives us promises, he gives them to us as a covenant God. And when it's a covenant God, he does not change. He does not lie. He's not man. So whatever promise God gives us, he has, he has given us a covenant. And when God made a covenant with Abraham, if you remember... He's the one who walked between the pieces of meat. And as he was walking through the sacrifices of the, the, the killed uh, animals, as he was walking there, he was saying, if I do not keep my promise, may it happen to me as it happened to these animals. He swore by his own name because there is no other name higher than him. And he was saying, if I do not keep the covenant, then may I die. He was willing to die. But God does not change. God always keeps his covenant keeper. And therefore, whatever God has promised, he will always keep it. And if he has put a promise in his Bible, he will fulfill it. So as Corinthians, I can't remember, the verse says, all the promises of God are yes and what? Yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Where we get the word no or wait, I do not know. But I would love, love to be shown where those words come in. So when I believe when I am interacting with the promise of God and I know it's yes and amen, will I be in a different position than that person who believes that a promise can be no or wait? Will we be on a different platform? Won't we be? I, you, even the person who believes in no and wait, they can fast, they can pray 24-7. But because they don't believe God's promises are yes and amen, there is doubt within. And remember, the only thing that pleases God is faith. But when I don't believe the promises of God are yes and amen, I will have room for doubt. And because I have room for doubt, the person who believes the promises of God, they will see the fulfillment of these promises in their lives while the other one who believes yes and no may be more pious, may acquire more disciplines, but their, their promises will not be fulfilled at the same level as mine who is working on faith. And therefore, I, as this is a, an introduction. And therefore, from what we have said is that God's power is available for everyone. In Jeremiah 1 verse 12, God says he is alert. He is watching over his word that he may fulfill it. He's waiting for you to speak the word. He's waiting for you to recount the promise that he has given you. He is alert. He is ready to fulfill that word. And Hebrews 1 verse 14, we are told the angels are ministering spirits 
uh, ministering to those who are called the heirs of salvation. God is alert, waiting to hear you call on him, ask him to, to do something for you so that he can dispatch his angels who are ministering spirits. They are our servants. Can you imagine? Men, sinful men, angels are our servants. They are the ones who minister to us. They are waiting for God to tell them, run, so and so needs help from you. And the angels are dispatched. And God is alert and ready, waiting for you to ask him. God has, uh, has through his finished work, he has provided everything that we need. It is up to you to know how to flip the switch. Turn on the power. God's power, it's available for all of us. And when we look at God and we go to Matthew 6, God is a provider. God is good. He is our father and he provides for us. Somebody refers to it as the sparrow principle. The birds don't sow, they don't reap, they don't store, but they don't miss any food. I remember Randy Skeet at, uh, when we were at railways, he preached one sermon, I am not an animal, and he used Matthew 6. And God provides for all of us, whether you are a believer, whether you are not a believer, because he's a good God. And there are those things that we will get from God because he's a good God. We will be saved because he's a good God if we call on him. But even as we are saved, our walk with Christ, from there on, it depends on how you release the power, how you tap in the power of God. How you, it's up to you how you grow from this. The day we are saved, how do you grow? Your walk with God will be different depending on how much power you tap from God. And today is the women's uh, prayer day. And it's about, um, what's the theme again? Prayer in the last days. And uh, today the story is about Joshua. And I want to use the story of Joshua to show you how you can move to the normal level, the ordinary level, where we talk about prayers, five minutes prayer. I am in the car, I am late driving my child to school, and I am saying a prayer, good, and those prayers are good. Those generic prayers that we make, we read a verse, and we are good, and we pray. But this is good for you, and it's a good thing to do. But if we want to move from that level to where we can see the manifestations of God's power, where we can see healing, where we can see deliverance, where we can come and pray for corona and it's ended. Where we can talk about our children, the sex education that is being taught in our schools and nobody is standing up. Where we can come and fight with God, wrestle with God, so that even the curriculum is changed. Where we can fight for our children, who have gone into drug abuse, substance abuse, they are addicted to pornography, to masturbation, and allow me to use this because it's time for boldness. If this is the last days and the prayers for the last days, so we need to be bold and talk with power. Our children are into masturbation. Our children are addicted to pornography. Our children are not just our children. Even old people like us are into sexual immorality. How are we going to stand in these last days and pray against this and walk boldly and tell people this has to stop? Where you are bold and you have power and you're not afraid. That is where we need to reach in these last days. And the story of Joshua illustrates how we can do all these things. When we look at Joshua, our, 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 our story comes from the first to third chapters of Joshua. And I want us to know a little about Joshua. 
And for us to know about Joshua, first of all, we go to Exodus 33, verse 11. At this time, Moses had erected a, a tent of meetings outside the camp. And that is where he used to go and meet with the Lord. And when he entered that place, the cloud would come and cover the tent of meetings. And Moses would do his business with God. The Israelites from their camps, they would come and stand at the door of their, their tents and watch Moses as he's doing his business. But Joshua was different. Joshua used to follow Moses up to the door of the tabernacle of meetings. And Joshua would sit there. I don't know whether he heard what Moses was talking with God. I don't know whether he was involved. But all I know is the Bible tells us Joshua sat at the tent of meetings. He didn't wait at his tent. Him, he followed Moses and sat there. And even after Moses finished his business and he went back to the camp, Joshua would be left there in the presence of the Lord. That is the kind of man that Joshua was. He is dropped into what Moses was talking with God. And after Moses went, Joshua is left in that place. That is the man we are talking about. A man who loved being in the presence of the Lord. A man, even when his mentor, his spiritual teacher left, he didn't follow him. He was left behind in the presence of the Lord. We do not know what happened. We are not told what happened when he left. He was left by Moses there. But we can only imagine how this impacted Joshua's life. When now in Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, just as Moses was dying, was ready passing on the mantle to Joshua, we see that Moses laid his hands on him and he was filled with the spirit of wisdom. Moses gave him his anointing. Moses passed on the mantle to Joshua. But many times it's not about the mantle. It's not about the anointing. He was anointed just like Elisha was anointed by Elijah. But the power, the, the, what gives the anointing power is the mantle. And when we look at Joshua, we see that Joshua had developed the spiritual disciplines. In Joshua verse 1 verse 8, we see the book of God telling Joshua, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, and you shall meditate in it day and night. And Joshua, this is what he did. This is what he told the children of Israel. He meditated on the law of the Lord every day and every night. And it's this discipline now that gave power to his anointing. So that even when he went before people, the people recognized his anointing and they were able to accept him and uh, respect him just the, and obey him just the way they had obeyed Moses. Because there was an anointing, there was a glory, there was an aura of godliness around Joshua. And that is one of the things that we need to do. Uh, we read in um, first, uh, sec, uh, is it first Peter? Second Peter, verse 5 and 7. We talked about how to develop those disciplines. Develop those disciplines. Because as you develop them, the glory of the Lord comes in you. You grow from one glory to another. You are transformed into the likeness of Christ. So, uh, so we see Joshua meditated on this. And for us, if we have to do the same thing, we need to meditate on God's word. And as the children preached here, we need to know the law of the Lord. We know the, pres the principles that God has laid down for us. Let us meditate them on them 
on a daily basis. Let us meditate. And the more you meditate, the more they become part of you. They stop being in, uh, head knowledge and they become heart knowledge. They become an experiential. You develop an experiential relationship with God. That is the only way we are going to stand and commune with the Lord. When we look at Joshua, we see he also had a very deep relationship with God. We have seen he stayed in the presence of the Lord. Moses has died. Moses, the great leader. His shoes were too big. Who could fit in his shoes? Joshua is being anointed, being told you're going to put in Moses' shoes, but they are too big. Joshua is paralyzed by fear. But Joshua had developed such a relationship with God that he was able to go to God and tell him, my dear father, I am terrified. I am so scared. What do I do? Why am, that is not in the Bible. But I'm just imagining for God to tell him, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. It, is, it must have been something that Joshua expressed to God. So God reassures him that just like I was with, your, with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Just do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. And when we are facing difficult times today, and you're afraid. There are things that you have to do. Your destiny calls you to do some things and you're very afraid. God is telling you, Hebrews 13 verse 5, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Second Timothy 1 verse 7, I have not given you a spirit of fear. I have given you a spirit of power, a spirit of courage, a spirit of sound mind and love. Anytime you're scared, I was talking to this little girl, uh, Ivy, as we were in here, and she's telling me she's going to do her exams next week. And I told her, the only reason why you're going to fail is if you're afraid. And I was telling and I'm repeating to the candidates who are here. When you go to that exam room next week, walk boldly and say, I do not have a spirit of fear. I have a spirit of power. I have a spirit of courage. I have a spirit of sound mind. And when you keep on repeating this, every time you hear the fear come, you repeat it. You're going to be courageous. You, and then you will say, I have the mind of Christ. I have the wisdom of God. I know all things. How can you fail when God has given you his mind? When you know all things as the Bible tells you. Why would a Christian fail? Why should we fail? Why should we not be doing great exploits? When we have the mind of Christ. When we have the wisdom of God. When we have, when we know all things. Is it because of the knowledge of God that we have? Can, we, can you really see now how important to have the right knowledge of God? It changes everything. It changes your life. It changes how you, you relate to God completely. Joshua. He believed in the power of confession. He is told now, prepare because we are crossing Jordan. We are moving to the other side. We are starting our battle with the, the, these giants that we call giants. Joshua calls the people. He knows the power of confession. He knows the power of repentance. He calls people and he tells them, that's Joshua 3 verse 5. Sanctify yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Who had told um, 
how did he know which wonders they were? But we see he knew that these people needed to sanctify themselves. God hears our prayers and hears everybody's prayers. But if we have to get into deeper things of God, we need to sanctify ourselves. We need to repent. And repent is not just saying, I'm sorry, I have done wrong. Repentance means change your way of thinking. You have been thinking right. Change your way of thinking. And the minute you change your way of thinking, you change your behavior. Because your behavior follows your thinking. So as we sanctify ourselves, as we repent of our sins, as we confess, and confession means agreeing with God about what God has said. God, you have said this in your word. I have not fulfilled this. I agree with you and I confess my sins. We need to sanctify ourselves. We have been forgiven because at the cross, the finished works of Jesus one of the finished works of Jesus is that we are forgiven. But when Christ forgives us, our spirit is made right with God. And it's sealed with his spirit. And it will never sin. But our soul, that is our mind, our emotions, our attitude, our will, is not transformed when we become new creation. And that's why... Uh, Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need our mind renewed. We need our mind sanctified. We need our emotions be made right. And this is what we are bringing to God. This is what we are telling God. My emotions are not right. I have unforgiveness in my life. I have anger issues in my life. I have a lot of bitterness. I have a lot of resentment. I am bringing them to you this morning and as I bring them sanctify me wash me clean that I may come to you when I am sanctified and that is what Joshua was telling people confess your sin to one another confess the faults that you have done uh, to God let us be cleansed by the washing of the blood. And once we are cleansed by the washing of the blood, then we can go and, and meet the Lord. In Psalms 24 verse 4 it says, Who will ascend to the hill of the Lord? Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Yes, we have been forgiven and you have been saved and there is no issue about that. You will go to heaven. But we need the power. We, need, we are core workers with God. We are here to change destinies of the nations. We are here to change our destinies of our children. We are here that when I get to pray, I pray with God. I get to know the destinies of my children. And I am supposed to pray according to the destinies of my children. But if I am not sanctified, if I do not come to God, God and cleanse me. There are so many blockages to my prayer that I will not be able to know the destiny of my children. I will not be able to know the destiny of nations. Right now we have Russia and Ukraine. We should be standing in the gap for Ukraine. How are we standing in the gap? Has any of you, has God revealed to any of you the divine strategies that God is going to use to redeem Ukraine from Russia. Because that is what we should be talking about. Somebody should be coming here to tell us, God spoke to me and he gave me this divine strategy on how we need to pray for Ukraine. Can anybody within the Adventist church stand up here and give us the divine strategy that God has given to us? I am challenging us as the Adventists. How are we praying? Are we just offering mundane prayers? Or are we reaching a point where we are working with the heart of God? Because that's what we are being called to do in these last days. And Joshua had reached that place where he, he knew the mind of God. He knew the divine strategies. God revealed to him the divine strategies. 
That is what we are going to be called to do in these last days. And when we sanctify ourselves, when we cleanse ourselves, then we, we seal all the loopholes that the, the devil may use because the devil is a legalist. The devil uses evidence. The devil does not just go to God and say, Nyakio is not good. No, he goes with evidence like we go to court with evidence. And so, is there anything that he knew that the devil can use against you? When we look at John 14, 30, just when Jesus was about to go to the cross, Jesus said, it's the devil is coming. But he has no claim on me. The Amplified says, he has no, no power over me or anything that he can use against me. The de Jesus was able to defeat the devil because there was nothing, no evidence that the devil could use against him. And that's why we need to sanctify ourselves, to confess, to repent, so that we close all those legal rights that the devil has. We take away the evidence. We tell God, take away this evidence. I agree this is in my life. Take it away. Close that loophole. Close that one. So that the devil has no legal right. But if we do not do this, then the devil has something in common with you. And your prayers will be blocked. That's why sanctification, confession, is very important. When we look again at Joshua, in chapter 1, we see God speaking to him. And when we go to Jericho, we again see God giving him divine strategies on how to do it. Later, we, uh, all this, we see Joshua did not do anything on himself. He waited on the Lord. The God, it's God who told him, this is the way we are going to win this war. Let's do this. Let's do this. And Joshua waited on God and he heard what God said. It's the Israelites were there. I, I think they were talking about five million Israelites. Joshua, we are not told he went to meet God like Moses. We are not told he went out. So Joshua, in the midst of the five million people, he was hearing God. How was God speaking to Joshua? How do you think uh, God spoke to Joshua. These divine strategies which were given to Joshua, how do you think they were given? Because we are not told Joshua went to meet God like Moses did. Joshua was among the people. So, how then did God speak to Joshua? And I can only imagine that Joshua was filled with the Spirit. Joshua walked by faith and not by sight. Joshua did not use the physical senses, the flesh. Joshua went beyond the five senses and he was able to hear God from his spirit. John 4 verse 4 tells us, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is not a physical being like I am. He is spirit. So if we have to worship him, we know the, the truth and we worship him in spirit. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 to 16. Uh, if you can put it up, please, because it's a little long. I would want uh, the people to look at it, but I will summarize it. It is the chapter which says, eyes have not seen, ears have not 
had. But after that, it says, but the spirit of God has revealed to man. So we keep on saying, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and we leave it at that. But if you go on, the spirit of God has revealed to man. And when we go on in, from that verse, uh, verse 10 to 16, God reveals things to us by his spirit. And the spirit, capital S, the spirit of God, searches all things, even the deep things of God. So God's spirit knows all things from God. And if you look at Romans 8 verse 16, it says the spirit, the spirit of God himself testifies with our spirit, small s, that we are children of God. So the spirit of God communes with our spirit. And when it communes with our spirit, the spirit of God reveals the deep things of God to our spirit. And when these deep things of God are revealed to our spirit, if we don't, we have allowed the spirit to become powerful in our lives, then our spirit will speak to us and reveal those deep things of God that have been revealed by the Spirit of God to our spirit, our spirit will reveal to our mind. And I will know the deep things of God. And we cannot know, the natural man cannot know the things of the spirit. What is the natural man? The natural man is when I use my senses. I use my hearing I listen, I feel, I taste. That's the natural man. I am using my intellect. But when I use my, I listen to my spirit, I feed my spirit. My spirit becomes quickened so that I can hear the things of God. Then I'll be able to commune with the spirit of God. The challenge is, and I am challenging us as the Adventists, because I challenge myself as an Adventist. How do I make my natural man weak? How do I weaken my natural man so that the spirit can become, have more power? Because until my spirit has more power, until my senses are deadened to a point that I can hear the spirit, then I will not be able to commune with the spirit of God. Some of the disciplines are prayer and fasting. Fasting does not move God because as I told you, God has already provided us all that we need for life and godliness. He did his part long ago. But you need to bring yourself to the level where you can hear God. And when you fast, you are beating your body. You are bringing your body to submission. And when, for those people I have had, I have friends who talk about fasting, who fast for 40 days, who, do so, who fast and pray for 40 days. Not one day like we have, uh, some of us, just a few of us, not all of us, because fasting is hard for an Adventist. There are some who are fasting today, but they are just fasting, maybe lunch and breakfast. I don't know whether it's the whole day, whether we have the Esther fast for three days, the two, two one days fast, or the 40 days fast. I have not had it. Maybe it happens, but if it happens, it happens to individuals, not to the corporate church. And it's my challenge to you. If we have to bring our senses into submission, where the spirit has to be strong enough to commune with the spirit of God, we need to develop the discipline of fasting. We need to develop the spirit of prayer. 
and prayer, not as we pray. Prayer, where you can pray for four hours, where you can pray for a whole day and a whole night. I've been following some apostles somewhere, and there's a day he said, from 11, it is prayer. People went through prayer the whole night, the whole day. They were just praising God and praying. And when that happens, you are, you are quickened. Your spirit is quickened. You can hear what God is talking about. You can hear testimonies of people who fast and pray. Honestly. God is appearing to them in dreams. God is appearing to them in visions. So I implore you, as the Adventist church, as the remnant as we call ourselves, we are the ones who need to be leading. We are the ones who need to lead people. That I should be here to tell you divine strategies. Because we see that Joshua asked people to sanctify themselves. I believe he sanctified himself more than these people did. And maybe he had also fasted, I do not know. But I want to imagine because he was so alert to the spirit of God. His spirit was so heightened. Maybe Joshua would just be around people like this. And God is just speaking to him. God is giving him the divine strategy. Go to Jericho. Do this. Do that. Just as he was sitting with other people. Because we, what is spiritually designed? What I can design in the spirit, I can design it in your presence. God may be just telling me, oh, there's somebody who is sick here. Can you pray for them? These are things that are happening to people who are alert to the working of the Spirit, who have denied themselves the things of this world, who have dedicated them to prayer and learning about God, dedicating time to God, Allowing their spirit to commune with the spirit of God. Because then you know the deep things of God. And that's how we know the desires of God. Because one of the reasons why we say the promises are yes, wait, or whatever. Is because we are not praying according to the desires of God. But if my spirit is alert. The spirit of God which reveals the deep things of God will reveal what God wants me to do. The kind of prayer that I need to make. Give me, download the divine strategies that I need to use to overcome something. But this can only be done if we allow the spirit to fill us. If we allow ourselves not to allow the flesh to dominate our lives, but to allow the spirit to dominate our lives so that our flesh comes to submission. And I believe Joshua had reached that level. That's why all these downloads were being given to him while the other people were just around him and they did not know about it. I pray in these last days that we may get to that level so that when we come here, we can even stop our sermons and we can, somebody comes here and says, God has just told me today is prayer and worship. We are not doing anything else. We are just going to praise God and sing and pray. No sermon today. A place where we will not be directed by programs. Where things have to be done this way. Because today if I came this morning and I just said, the Lord has spoken to me. There is no sermon today. Can we sing and praise? What would happen in this place? That kind of programming. Might it be affecting. Our being led by the spirit. Because if I am so focused on giving my sermon. How can I hear the spirit speak to me? How will I hear the spirit to me? And I have to deliver my sermon. How can I come to this church? Am I bold enough? 
Because we've said we have the spirit of boldness and power. Am I bold enough to come to an Adventist church and say, no sermon today. Let us pray. Let us praise and worship. How long can we sing? How long can we praise God? I've told you I'm listening to other people because I want to discover something that I don't have. And I attend this prayer and uh, one day I attended this prayer and there was singing and praising. It was, it, was, it was a weekday. And there was a lot of praising. And the person kneels and he sings and you can see he's praising God for more than an hour on his knees. And the voice is so strong. And they sang for four hours. And people are just praying. And the, when they came, the, the preachers came, they just said, oh, the Holy Spirit has just spoken to us. Today we are just praising and worshiping. And there was no sermon. And that was it. And I can tell you for sure by evening, there was manifestation of God's power. There was a presence that you could feel. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. How are we praising? How are we worshiping God? As we move on to Joshua, you will see, I can't remember which, which part it is. When he asked, how are we going to conquer the nations of Canaan? And God told him, uh, in what order? And God told him, Judah is going to lead the war. You know the meaning of Judah? Praise. The tribe of Judah is the one which was to go first. Meaning, it is praise that is going to win this battle. It is praise that is going to do a difference. We can preach here for 10 hours. We can do whatever we want to do. But the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. A place where there is no praise. A place where there is no, wash, uh, no singing. There is no prayer. There is no fasting. We, can, we will pray and we will be fine. But we shall not see the manifestation of God's power. And in these last days, what we are seeking is the manifestation of God's power. We are going through such difficult times that the normal prayers are not going to work. They will allow us to do our daily things, but they will not overcome. They will not make a difference. How would it be if today as New Life Church... We are what? To say we are going to pray. We are going to listen to the spirit of God. Tell us who the leader of this country is going to be. Who we are going to vote in in August. And we listen to the spirit of God. And we allow our spirit to hear. And we start praying and fasting. Praising God. Worshipping. So that we can get the leader that God has planned for us. How do you think we could change Kenya if we did that? If God says, I looked for one man and I didn't find him, how, would, how much would he do if the whole of New Life Church stood up in the gap for the nation of Kenya? We forget about tribes. We come and sanctify ourselves. We repent about our tribalism and then we seek God in prayer and tell him, may our spirit commune with your spirit and let us know who the leader of this nation is going to be. How do you think we could impact the nation of Kenya? I believe there's so much that we can do, but we have to be willing to be used of God. In these last days, in these times of crisis, you have to be willing. You cannot just be eating three meals every day. You cannot be reading your Bible for just five minutes or one hour. You cannot be praying for 20 minutes. No, it's time we had cashers. It is time we went to the mountains, even if it's for three days, to fast and pray for this nation, to fast and pray for our children, to fast and pray for our, our different organizations because we are talking about how far Kenya has gone. What are you doing about it? 
You have the power. Flip the switch. You can release the power of God. How, I, how much power are you going to use? That is the question that I want to leave New Life, New Life Church with this morning. Lastly, we see when Joshua, after he prayed and everything was, um, now they were to cross, he, step, he took a step of faith. He did not, not know how God was going to do it. But he had told God, the Israelites, you will see God's wonders tomorrow. He didn't know how these wonders would be. But he waited for God's strategies. And God told him what to do. Tell the priests to step into the what, river, what, uh, river Jordan. It was flooding. It was heaven's time. It was overflowing its banks. But he told the priests. And the priests obeyed. And they walked a step of faith. The only thing that pleases God is faith. And faith is belief in action. You need to step and start walking in faith. If you have to see things happen, things change, step out in faith. Whatever your destiny is, step out in faith. Whatever it is that God has called you to go and do, step out in faith. You could Change the nations. I don't know what God is calling you to do. Don't start giving excuses. Like Joshua, allow yourself. Just believe God has said so, and let's step out. We shall see the wonders of God. And this year is the, one, uh, the year of wonders without warning. Just step out, step out by faith, and you will see wonders without warning. And after they crossed, we see memorial stones. It's always nice to remember. He told the Israelites to erect some stones so that they could teach their children, why are these stones here? Oh, because God did this and this. The only way, the promises of God, we can know that God has answered our prayers is to have these memorial stones. Do you have a gratitude journal? A journal of your walk of faith? where you keep on writing down what God has done to you so that when you are discouraged, you will always go back and say, God did this. God did this. And if he did this, then even this he will do. Because Joshua's faith was encouraged by what had happened. If the Red Sea, which was bigger than the Jordan, had parted, then what was Jordan? And because of that, his faith was strengthened. His faith was strengthened. Let us have memorial stones. Let us have things that can remind us of God's power. Because when we do, then our faith will be strengthened. And we'll, we will be able to strengthen other people in their walk of faith. So my dear brothers and sisters, I, as I said... I have taken quite a lot of your time, but I just want to believe we are here for such a time as this. God has provided us with power. God, the power you receive is dependent on you. If I leave you with nothing else, remember, nobody has more power than anybody else. God has given us all things that we need for life and godliness. How much you enjoy that is dependent on you. And even when God says this is dependent on you, I believe God loves us so much that he believes we can make the right choices and choose to enjoy all the promises of God Choose to live a full life and abundant life. Choose to walk as he wants us to walk. Choose to live our destinies. Choose to do what God wants us to do. It's my prayer for you in Jesus' name.